Good afternoon. Today is July 25th, 2015. My name is Katherine Grubar. I'm conducting an oral history interview at the Leroy American Legion Post in Leroy, Illinois with Lynn Schindel. Please state your name and your address for the record. Uh, Lynn C. Schindel. My address is 19246 East 850 North Road, Bloomington, Illinois. Okay, we're going to jog your memory to start with. Which war did you serve in? Vietnam. Were you drafted? Or no. Were you, did you enlist? Yes, I enlisted. Awesome. What was your age? 19. Just turned 19 a month before I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? Carlock, Illinois. Were you single or married? Single. Why did you join? My dad was a Pearl Harbor survivor. Why did you pick the branch that you joined? Uh, Mom and Dad and I had a talk. It was either Marine Corps or the Navy. And they talked me out of Marine Corps, so I went into the Navy. Do you recall your first days in service? Oh, yes. What were they like? Uh, first day was leaving the train station in Bloomington, Illinois. And, uh, first time I'd see my father cry. <laughs> because it was Pearl Harbor Day when I left. And I went to Great Lakes uh, Naval Training Center and we arrived there late in the evening and uh, first thing they did was took all our civilian clothes and stuff away from us and start issuing uniforms to us and a little sewing kit to hem our pants up and uh, sent us to some barracks and that's what we had to do that evening was to hem our pants up and nobody's was straight. I mean nobody knew how to sew. And then we went for haircuts and stuff and they, they saw my hair off. It was like four o'clock in the morning when we finally got to sleep. Tell me about your boot camp training and experiences. Most of the training in boot camp uh, involved Navy terminology, uh, not tying learning the different ranks, yeah. orders of a century. Uh, it was mostly for shipboard type of duty. It wasn't what I really uh, ended up doing, but it was it geared to the being in the regular Navy and a fleet. And uh, a lot of classes, a lot of margin, uh, very cold. Uh, first time they'd ever closed the O'Hare Airport was when I was in boot camp because of the snow and uh, that's what I remember the most how cold it was in Great Lakes that time of year. Apparently that's where your boot camp was? Great yeah, Lakes? Great Lakes. Did you get to home on leave after boot camp or did you go straight to your first assignment? They gave us I believe it was a, a week's travel time and then I went to uh, Florida and left nice cold Illinois weather and arrived outside of Jacksonville, Florida at a Naval Air Station, uh, Cecil Field, and uh, it was 75 degrees when I landed there. Do you remember your instructors? At boot camp? Or, oh. Yeah, we had a gunny sergeant, or a uh, gunner's mate, first class, very short guy, wore combat boots but he was a SEAL. He'd been through SEAL training and the first day we were, he introduced himself to us. He was asking who could be the company commander when he wasn't there. And if anybody could knock him off the table he was standing on, they could be company commander. A couple big guys thought they could do it. Well, they found out that number 10 boot dockers in the head because he was also a black belt and he knocked them both out and a little short guy stepped forward was probably two inches shorter than he was and said I can do it and about the time the first class started to put a boot in the air this kid stepped side step and knocked him out with a sidekick because he had a black belt in karate but he was so short 
that it, the sword they give when we marched would go jing 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 on the ground because he, his sword would drag on the ground. So it was so funny when you you could hear us marching down the street, you'd hear jing jing, and a little while jing jing. And it was, but it was pretty a pretty. Uh, he was a gunner's mate, first class. Uh, A. M. Wright was his name, and I can always remember him. So how did you get through it? Did get through boot camp? Mm -hmm. I learned a lot of things there. I learned to respect, and uh, of course everybody's scared to death. I mean, you don't want to do anything wrong. Being the winter time, and being that this was, they were running these classes like for fleet sailors. One of the things you had to do was we had wash room with a uh, wash trail, uh, troughs, and uh, that's where you washed your clothes. And uh, after your clothes were washed, they went outside to an outside clothesline. Now we were on the second level of a two two level building so we had to go down a set of stairs and go out in a courtyard that was in between uh, the barracks is there and tie your clothes on this clothesline using these little strings and everything had to be a square knot had to be three fingers apart on this clothesline well anybody knows in december your clothes freeze they don't dry they just freeze so they froze on the clothesline well, in the washroom, in the back of the washroom, they had a drying room with uh, coat line, uh, uh, clotheslines. And we'd, we'd bring the frozen clothes in and hang them up on the clothesline to dry out after we'd washed it. But they had to be on the clothesline because every day they came around and they graded your bunks. Uh, they graded uh, how your clothes were tied on it and they would gig you. Uh, and a gig meant that you are going to have extra duty for something, and it, and each company up there in Great Lakes was competing for flags. It was a sign of uh, uh, superiority, I guess you would call it. So everybody was competing for these different colored flags, and each one stood for a different uh, thing. Like if you received one flag, it might be for education, but uh, you pass the highest grades in your company against other companies, you know. Another one might be for what you did in the drill hall when you went to march and drill the drill hall. But at the end of graduation ceremony, you got to carry all your flags. And the more flags you had, the better your company commander looked in and his commander. So that's that's basically what it's for. Did you have any special buddies at boot camp? I did, but I lost track of them after boot camp. They went there and they had orders to different duty stations, and none of them ended up in Florida. Well, I ended up, I don't know, they, they must have went to ships. Uh, my rating uh, was an AA when I left boot camp. That's an airman apprentice, and I was attached to an A-4 fighter squadron in Florida. Uh, I didn't have any formal schooling in, in aeronautics, but they sent me to the squadron. Of course, when you're, according to Navy regulations, if you're below the rank of E4, you ended up doing mess cooking 90 days every year. Well, that was the first thing they stuck me doing, mess cooking in Florida. But I didn't mind it. Okay, we're going to go some experiences. Um, what war did you serve in, which you've already answered? Where exactly did you go? My first tour was on a USS Intrepid with the fighter squadron out of Florida. And we made a round the world cruise on that ship. Going over, we went under the tip of South Africa and uh, stopped in the Philippines and picked up, <coughs> excuse me, ammunition and, and foods and things that we needed. And then we went up in what they call Yankee Station, which is in the northern part of North Vietnam, right next to Hanoi, up in the northern part, and that's Yankee Station, and where the DMZ was, was anything south of that was called Dixie Station. So we'd stay up there and do flight quarters, and pilots would fly in country and, and, and back to the ship, and, uh, and then after 30 days, we'd go to a port, uh, like
like Subic Bay, the Philippines, for three days R and R, and then we'd go back on the line again. And uh, if we ran out of something, we always had uh, cargo ships coming along. Every two or three days, we had a cargo ship, and we took on fuel, ammunition, and food, and anything else we needed would come along on these other ships. It had to be either helicoptered over to our carrier or uh, hand-lined over our carrier while they were taking on uh, fuel for the ship. And that's including jet fuel for the jets and stuff, too. And what was your job or assignment? I worked on the flight deck uh, for about two months as a plane captain, which is a brown shirt. Each guy on the flight deck has a different job, had a different colored shirt. Uh, ordnance guys had red ones. Fuel guys had a purple one. Uh, the uh, plane captains, which I was, had a brown shirt. My job was to take care of that airplane. Uh, I had to wipe it down, clean it, make sure it was fueled with, had oxygen in it, and had fuel in it. Because they were single engine planes, I uh, had to strap, help strap the pilot in. They had a small ladder that went alongside that sat alongside the aircraft, but it had a place where you could attach it. And they had seven safety pins that you had to pull out and make sure were, uh, there was uh, four, no, there was three in the two, uh, all three landing gears had a safety pin in them, uh, the wheels, landing gears, and then the ejection seat. Now these ejection seats, were a zero to 200 foot seat. He could sit there in, his, in the cockpit and if something caught fire or something went wrong, he could eject out of that and go up 200 feet and his seat chute would open up and he could float down to safety. But it didn't do the plane captain any good because they were on a rocket motor and they would actually burn a hole right through the bottom of the plane. So when they went off, it was, if you were in the wrong place, you got toasted. There was safety pins in those seats that we had, because it was a rocket motor, we had to make sure they were put in when he got back from a flight and when he, before he left, make sure they were taken out. And we always held them up in our hands. We had hand signals. Uh, and it just depended who the pilot was, you know, that day, you know. Did you see any combat? When I came back to the U.S. after that cruise with the Intrepid and our squadron <laughs> departed in Norfolk where we started out. I had already changed my job title, which in the Navy terms is your rating. I went from an airman apprentice to a seaman apprentice to a construction apprentice, which meant I could go back in country as a CV. And that's why I changed over to become a CV. And uh, my second tour, I was in country in Fubai. Our battalion was out of uh, Davisville, Rhode Island, and MCB-1, that's the battalion I was in, we went back, and uh, we were at Fubai, Wei, Quang Tree, and what my job was, was uh, asphalt. I worked in an asphalt crew, and we did all the Highway 1, a lot of the bases around there, the taxiways, and, and different things. Were there any casualties in your unit? No, but we had a guy that got hurt, but he didn't, he didn't leave the unit. Can you tell me about a couple of the most memorable experiences you had? I think it was probably going to these other countries on ship. Uh, I was in Hong Kong, I was in Sydney, Australia, I was in Wellington, New Zealand. Sasebo, Japan, numerous times in uh, Subic Bay. Uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro was there twice. Uh, it just seeing how other people lived, you know, it, it, it was quite interesting. I like, I was really interested in touring those other countries. You know. Did you have any comrades who you remember well? The only comrade I remember is my friend from Carlisle. He was MIA, and I didn't find out for over a year 
that he was MIA and he's still MIA. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yeah, I got uh, what they call a Gita medal. When you get out of boot camp, you get that medal. And then I got uh, the Vietnam Service Medal and uh, I forget what the Vietnam Campaign Medal and two uh, Navy unit commendations. I got two of those. But all my medals also have stars on them, which each one of those stars for Marine Corps insignia on, on the vet uh, because we were attached to an uh, expeditionary force, Marine Corps. We did work for them, so we got to wear there. But I, each one of those stars for a stood for a tour. So I, I've got all these stars and bars on my ribbons and stuff. Okay, we're going to go to your life a little bit. How'd you stay in touch with your family? Best way was letters. Everybody had a little cassette recorder, and that was the best way to stay in touch. You could hear your family's voice, and so I would send a letter home. It wasn't every day, but but CBs you work 20, 20 some hours a day sometimes. You, you do it till the job gets done. And that's the model the CBs can do. And we did. I mean, there was jobs that. Nobody thought they could do the Army Corps, and the Army engineers couldn't do it. We did it. Such as? Putting in bridges and stuff in record time. Because we got, when I joined the, uh, the battalion, uh, it was right after 68 Tet Offensive. So we were right up in way after all the damage was done. And we had to go repair a lot of the bridges and stuff. And uh, it was a messed up city. I mean, it, it was all blowed up and different parts of the city and we put in new roads and stuff and hospitals and anything that the Viet Cong or North Vietnamese tore up we would try to rebuild. Did a lot of community work I call it. Uh, they call it civil civil projects and uh, civilian projects. And we did a lot of that work. What was the food like there? Everything but the ham and lima beans that came in the sea rash. They had a name for that, and I won't repeat it. It was the ham and mutts. I won't repeat the rest of it, but I got stuck with them, and I still cannot, 50 years later, I can still not eat a lima bean. I just hate them things. Uh, coming back on ship, we ate roast beef morning, noon, and night for 54 days straight because they were trying to empty out the reefer decks and get, get ready for the ship to go to dry dock. So they had to get rid of all the food that was in the refrigeration. Uh, canned milk, 1942, canned milk. You had fresh milk when we got on the ship. Two weeks out, we ran out of milk. They started bringing out the canned milk. It was like drinking milk on. I could not tolerate that stuff, even on cereal or drinking it in a glass. Uh, Navy has the best cooks. I'll swear by that because I ate some of the Marine Corps food down at Camp Lejeune. It wasn't that great. Our Marine, our, uh, a lot of Marines I brought back to the base and fed them, you know, brought them in the chow hall and stuff and they had to feed. And, uh, but we had a good chief petty officer when I was on the asphalt crew and we were paving 24 hours straight. He would bring hot food out. He had a, little, he had a Jeep with a little two-wheel trailer. And he'd go back to the dining hall and bring hot food out to us as we were working. And there was a lull in between in between the dump trucks, and we were waiting more asphalt to come. He would bring us warm food and stuff. It was always good to have fresh food because them sea rations ain't careful in that bad. Did you have had plenty of supplies? Did you anything you yeah. Out I got a lot of Gita packages from my mom. She was a cook. They ran her own restaurant. And so she was always sending me cookies and stuff, and I'd pass them around and stuff. But it was, we didn't really run out of food. We had a lot of food and stuff. Uh, even on a ship, there was always food there because they had two dining halls, or two chow halls. When one would be open, the other would be shut down for cleaning. And then that would shut down, and the other one would open. And that went on during flight quarters, went all day long. Uh, the ship's crew, you had either one end, of, one would be 
to food and the other one wouldn't. And at night they had what they called mid rats, which was rations for the crews that worked nights. Uh, they had food for them too. So yeah, that's one good thing about the Navy. They had, they had good food. Did you feel any pressure or stress at that time? Yeah, at times there was a lot of stress, a lot of stress to get the job done, and, you know, and, and uh, the weather did cooperate a lot of times. Uh, 69 October, we had six feet of rain in one month's time and flew by, so everything that we built was underwater. Uh, I can remember there on the base that some of the uh, bunkers we had set up for security couldn't get to them because they were underwater. And guys would have to go out with a rowboat, sit with an M60 machine gun in a rowboat tied up to the wire out there because the bunkers were underwater. And uh, always wet. That much, I mean, you always. I had two sets of jungle boots, and they'd last about 60 days if you were lucky. And then I'd have to trade them in and get another set because they just rot off. Was there anything special that you did for good luck? Not really. I just, I didn't really count on luck. I just counted on my buddies. How did people entertain themselves? Oh, we had, we had USO shows come in once in a while, but they were all Filipinos or Orientals. No, no round eyes. Never saw, never saw an American anybody with round eyes in any of these tours. We heard rumors that Bob Hope was going to be in Da Nang. And we had worked 26 hours straight and the chief let us have, uh, Chief Petty Officer was in charge of our detachment, said you guys can take the rest of the day off. So we piled in a deuce and a half truck and drove two and a half hours down to Da Nang and got to the gate and they wouldn't let us in because we didn't have a Class A uniform on uh, West General Westmoreland. Wouldn't let anybody on the base unless they had their uh, Class A uniform. And so we sat outside the wire up on a hill outside the base there and watched the show from up there. What we could see of Were you granted leave occasionally? Yeah. And what did you do on leave? I went to R&R. Uh, &R. I took R&R &R in Japan. Because uh, when our ship was there, I was very amazed how clean Japan was. Uh, so when I took R&R in &R a town called uh, Atami, A-T-A-M-I, it was kind of like a resort town. And they recommended that when we landed in Japan at the R&R uh, &R Center, they recommended that town. I don't know if they was a little incentive there, but I went there. It was a nice, had a nice hotel room and stuff, and uh, went to a bar there and uh, ran into a girl, an American girl from Oklahoma City that ran the bar and owned the bar, and spent the whole week there just talking to her and sitting at the bar and visiting with other guys. And then I'd go sightseeing and buy things like camera and stuff like that. I bought a whole set of Noritake China in Japan for like $30. I mean, it was expensive stuff, but I didn't have to pay much for it, so I bought it and sent it home to my mom. And uh, I bought a Yashika camera there. And just sightseeing, but I was amazed. I took the bullet train. That was one of the first fastest trains and then into uh, Tokyo, 100 miles an hour. But you could go to their train station, there was nothing, not dirt, not oil, everything was perfect. All the rocks that were underneath the train tracks looked like they had just put them there. It was so clean. And then you run into people on the street and they put masks on. If they have a cough or something, they don't walk around and expose you or I to it. They put a mask on, you know. And uh, very courteous, very friendly people, very clean. Uh, I really enjoyed the country. Do you recall any particularly humorous and unusual events? Yeah, we had uh, occasion. Uh, 
of uh, once in a while we'd run into these rock apes. And it was like a monkey. I don't know what kind of, we call them rock apes. It was a monkey. And you could be driving up the mountain on this two lane road called High Bob Pass. That was separated way from Da Nang. And these animals would throw rocks and hit your dump truck in the side, you know, and it sounded like a grenade going on, landing in your truck. So you'd stop right away and get out, stand around a couple minutes. And then you'd get and look in the back of the truck or a big old rock in the back of the truck, you know. So get back in, drive down the road, pretty soon another clunk, you'd hear another clunk. Stop, jump out, what the heck's going on? And it was these monkeys. You'd, then you'd see the monkey up on a, in a tree, just laughing and laughing, you know, and they just laugh at you and stuff. And uh, then when we were, when I, my last duty station in Diego Garcia, when we got there, yeah, there was nothing there on that island except uh, the coconut pickers and a, a British agent for the British government and these donkeys. And these burls and little donkeys ran loose on the island. And they used them at one time to pull their wagons, but now they have a tractor, so they didn't do they, they let them run loose, and we caught a bunch of those little donkeys. Well, at that time, we didn't know they were protected, so we were having donkey races on Sunday afternoon, you know. And I can remember you guys having, getting on those little things, and those little donkeys that buck them off. But we had a lot of fun doing stuff. What did you think of your officers and your fellow soldiers? A lot of the officers I had were young. The older officers I had a lot of respect for. A lot of these young graduates from Annapolis and different places, I didn't get along with them, but the chief petty officers, the guys that were, made a career out of the Navy, they got my respect big time. My senior, senior petty officers, I got, gave them a lot of respect, the first classes, Petty officers have been in. I gave them a lot of respect. And I still do. I, I learned a lot from them, and they treated me good. I mean, uh, my E7 that I had in Vietnam. He says, I don't know why, Shindle, you came in as an Airedale. He said you should have come in as a CB. And I said, Well, that's what classification they gave me in boot camp. He said, I have no problem with you. He says I got third class first class, second class petty officers working out here that had come in on this special program they had. He said, they don't know as much about driving equipment as you do. And so he said, I hope you stay in. I said, I'd like to, but they want me to take these correspondence courses. See, a lot of guys went to A school and they graduated from school and then they take a fleet wide, which is a worldwide examination for their rating for their pay grade, and you compete against them. Well, I didn't have a chance to go to A school, so they had everything in their minds. They knew these questions, and they gave me correspondence books. I didn't have time for that stuff. In fact, I threw them away. Every time they gave me a set, I threw them away because they took up room in my sea bag, and they weighed so much. And uh, so I didn't. I never did get hired E3 in, uh, in the Navy. Keep a personal journal. No. Okay. That now was against the rules. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. We're gonna go a little bit after service. Do you recall the day that your service ended? Yeah. Where were you? Uh. The actual day or the date of my enlistment run out. Either or. The day I I got out of service, I was in Chicago. I got discharged in Chicago because on the island of Diego Garcia in my third month, I was working on a rock crusher and I got 31 pieces of coral in my eye and we had no hospital. It was just a bare island when we got there. So they hadn't built a hospital yet. All they had was a couple mobile home trailers stuck together as a mobile hospital. And so they medevaced me to Subic Hospital and from Subic, I called home and uh, got a little help from Congressman Les Aarons uh, to get me back to the States because they kept telling me they might have to operate behind. I didn't want to 
done in that hospital, I wanted it done back in the States. Because if I figure if I could get to Chicago, my parents could come down okay. and stuff. So he could help me get me back to Chicago. And uh, they medics checked me out at the hospital in Chicago and pretty much had cleared up by then. They didn't have to do the surgery and stuff. So, so how did you get home then? Uh, Mom and Dad came and picked me up. What difference did you notice about the world at home when you got home at the time you went in, before you went in? That I couldn't sit down at a coffee table in a little town of Carlock where I grew up. Uh, people would not come up to you and welcome you home. I didn't get no welcome home. Every time I came home, I didn't get no welcome home. I had my uniform on, very proud of my uniform. I wore it everywhere. And that's the regular Navy uniform. I wore it everywhere. And even when my best friend was home on leave from Vietnam and he was getting ready to go back, him and I got together. He was in the Army and we had picture taken with him and his dress uniform, me and my dress uniform. And it just, the girls I went to high school with, I mean, I went to class, my graduating class from eighth grade was 13 kids. I mean, uh, so it was six girls and seven boys. Never heard from any of those girls. I, you know, some of them were girlfriends when I had night in grade school. And it just completely different board that we were kind of alienated from everybody. The only ones that would listen would be other veterans and mom and dad and my brother. That was it. What did you do in the days and the weeks after you came home? Went back to work. I met a gal, my, uh, my wife, which I've been married 42 years. She reminded me the other day we've been married 42 years. In Rhode Island, I uh, was working part-time at a gas station one night, helping a friend out, another, another CB. She pulled in and wanted her snow tires rotated off her car and there were other tires put on. If we would do that, could we get, she could get some, uh, they were giving away steak knives and glasses for 10 gallons of gas. I gave her a case of steak knives, I gave her a case of glasses because I knew when I ran into her, I was gonna marry her. And uh, she didn't like me. She didn't, uh, the first couple of dates we went out, she didn't care, but then about the third or fourth date we went out on, I shaved my beard. At that time, you were allowed to. Maybe was allowed to have beards. I shaved my beard and I quit smoking. I told her that was an engagement present. I quit smoking and I hadn't touched any alcohol since then. Either. So that was 1971. 1971. Did you make any close friendships while in service? No, because everybody called me Seabag, that was my nickname, Seabag, because I had been in so many different duty stations. Uh, even in Vietnam, I was sent to the Air Force for 90 days to work temporary duty with the security police as a customs inspector, checking the luggage going in and out of the country and, and, and troops coming in and off the airplanes. And I kind of decided then, if I ever go back in the service, I'm gonna go in the Air Force because these guys, they don't do mess cooking. They don't have to make their own racks. They don't have to clean their uniforms like we did uh, or spit shine their boots. They had ladies or mamasons to do all that stuff for them. I thought, oh, this is great. In the Navy, you do all that stuff. You know, you, you, get, every, you get everything ready. And so uh, all I did was go over and sit at the airport and watch planes come in and check luggage and then make sure the GIs that came in country exchanged their uh, American dollars for the script. And that was a, that was a joke. I really love to do that on these guys because some of them come in with a couple hundred dollars and maybe twenty dollars worth of coins. Well, they have to change it for paper money. So these guys would start out with a little stack of uh, paper money and a few coins and ended up with a stack of that script and it was like nickel and dime paper money. You know these. They weren't used to all that. And what am I going to do with all this stuff? I said, that's the money they use over here. Because they don't use, you can't use greenbacks because it's uh, uh, the black market was taking the greenbacks. So they, 
was made of exchange. And at the same when they came, when they got ready to go home, they had to change their script back into U.S. dollars. They did the same thing. But we would get uh, the Army uh, MPs would bring in prisoners of war and leave them with us in our little area there. They leave them with us. Uh, so they could go to the PX and buy stuff. And then they'd come back and pick the prisoners up and take them out to a, a prisoner of war camp that they had. But they leave them with us temporarily. And that was the first time I saw a woman who was probably the roughest of more men. Uh, because I, there was a counter there. We sat there at the counter and watched the traffic. And they sat behind us next to some file cabinets. And uh, this big MP came, he had brought her in earlier, and I'm sitting at the counter and I kept feeling moisture, you know, what the heck is going on, and I turned around and looked at the ceiling, couldn't figure out what was going on. About that time that MP started walking towards me and he went from smile to a frown to mad, and he busted in the door, uh, tore in the door of the office there. He hauled off and popped her and nailed her, knocked her up against the file cabinet. She was spitting on me, and I couldn't see it because she was behind me. And he saw it when he walked in. And he said, don't you dare turn your back on that gal. She's rougher than 10 men. She says, uh, she's a, a colonel or a captain in the North Vietnamese Army. She says, uh, she'll slit your throat if she gets a chance. I said, well, now you tell me. So he took her out of there. They took her out. They had her handcuffed all the time. He, they took her out and uh, never saw him again. You know. When you got home, did you join any of the veterans organizations? Oh, yeah. American Legion. Uh, VFW wouldn't let us in. Uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, I joined them. Uh, I, I belonged about, let's see, I belonged to CB Veterans of America. DAV, I'm a life member. VFW, I'm a life member. American Legion. Uh, AMVETS. Let's see. Two or three different unit unit groups like MCB1, I belong to them. MCB40, I belong to them. So I'm pretty active. And of course, my dad was at Pearl Harbor. And in 1993, we formed a chapter of Sons and Daughters in Illinois, and now I'm the state chairman for the whole state of Illinois. So my dad was on. That's when my dad really opened up. Was when I got home after my last tour, me and I started going to Pearl Harbor events with all these survivors. And uh, he always looked, looked forward to being him. Always rode together and stuff to different events. Okay. Next segment. Years later, what did you go on to do as a career after the war? I went to work at a telephone company for a short period of time as a lineman. I got injured on a job and went to work at ISU as a janitor at ISU. And later I transferred over to the heating plant and became a stationary engineer at the heating plant. And that's where I retired from uh, ISU as the heating plant. Did your military experience influence your thinking about the war and about the military in general? Yeah, because after I got out of the regular service, I wasn't done. I joined the Air National Guard Fjord and served uh, three and a half years over there as a sergeant, E-4. They promoted me over there. I got an honorable discharge from the Air Force for my first uh, tour with them. And then I joined the Army National Guard in Bloomington later on to move closer to my family so I wouldn't have to travel in the wintertime. And I served a year with them and then they got an Army to, uh, my son was having some medical problems and we believe it was from Agent Orange. And so I dropped out. But I was involved with the Downs Fire Department, made the rank of Assistant Chief. Uh, I was also an EMT, EMT instructor. American Heart Instructor for the Heart Association. I did a lot of volunteer work, so I kind of, I couldn't sit still after I got out of service. I, I'm a volunteer person. How'd your service and your experiences expect, 
affect your life? It did. The service, the Agent Orange, finally got to me. Uh, knock on wood, my wife has put up with me for 42 years, and she's seen the worst of me of some of the things that my private physician, I wasn't going to the VA. I didn't go to the VA until the early 80s. Uh, and my private doctor, I kind of, by reading online, I kind of talked to him about these uh, skin conditions I was having that he had to keep lancing and operating on. And I finally asked him, I said, could this be Agent Orange? His words to me were, I can't say directly, but it, because I'll be sued by the government if I tell you it's Agent Orange. And then he tapped me on the shoulder and winked. So I knew it was Agent Orange, but he just couldn't say because of the legal part. And that's when he, he was the one that discovered I had melanoma cancer in 1984 and probably saved my life. I never got any compensation, and all my claims were turned down, and in 1986, I swore I'd never walk in another VA hospital from the way I was treated. And in 2010, my best friend in Bloomington, or one of my friends in Bloomington, who was an Agent Orange veteran, told me if I didn't go back to Peoria and get back on, file some more claims, get back on, that he was going to hook a rope around my neck and hook it on the bumper of his car and drag me over there, which he would have. So I went over uh, to Mike McDonald at, at uh, Armory, and at first he didn't think I was going to get anything, so it kind of made me mad. I was getting my temper was getting up again, so I got in my truck and I drove directly to Peoria, the VA clinic. I was like, damn, I, I was welcomed like a lost son. They gave me paperwork to fill out. I filled the paperwork out. First thing I know, I'm 30% disabled. Next thing I know, I've got doctors going here, doctors going there. They're having, and, and next thing I know, I'm up to 70%. So right now, I'm at 70% disabled. But I had a lot of my records, a mistake a lot of veterans don't have, is I took all my civilian records from my Carl doctor uh, up there and all my x-rays and everything signed all the releases for them so they could get copies back and forth. And I still do that. Uh, my VA doctors know exactly what my uh, Carl doctor's doing or OSF doctor's doing. They, and, uh, and the veterans doctors know exactly what they're doing. So I don't want to keep, make, keep them in, you know, a secret. But. What similarities or differences do you see in the world as a veteran compared to that of those currently serving in the military? I don't see right now that the, the younger guys coming home have as much initiative to join. They're kind of feel I feel like they're out there on their own. They're on like a loner. When they're little in their little groups, they're fine, but they don't want to belong to anything like the American Legion, VFW, or DAV. It's hard to get them to join, and it's understandable because they're trying to get their lives back on track. Some have been in a long time, been in a lot of tours, suffered a lot of stuff. Uh, and my advice to them is uh, to join these groups because there's people right there that'll help them. You know, they, they don't want to ask for help. They're very proud. They don't want to ask for help. That was my problem, too. I didn't want to ask for help. Uh, until I got to the point where I knew there was something going on in my body and talking to other veterans that had the same conditions. And I knew what it was. I just needed somebody in the government to tell me what it was. And it took them 40 years to tell me. I knew a long time ago. In fact, uh, when I got my Silver Rose Award, for Agent Orange. The man, uh, I met all the criteria. I, I had all my medical records. He got copies of all that. And he, he had looked my records over and knew that I qualified for the Silver Rose Award. So, 
that was the first thing I was very proud of. Uh, the other medals that I got in Vietnam didn't mean as much to me as knowing I wasn't going crazy. For 40 years, I always thought I was going crazy. And, you know, I, I told my wife that. I said, I think I'm going crazy. Oh, no, you're not crazy. I said, well, something's going on, and I, I and can't get a straight answer out of anybody. Now I know. Is there anything that you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? No, I've probably talked long enough. <laughs> well, that's the end of the interview, and I, for one, would like to say thank you for your service. Thank you. And welcome home. Thank you.